Hi, we're here with Alex Friedland uh, from Morantis, uh, CEO and co-founder, and uh, we are. Uh, you are here for an exclusive look at us filming an interview with him for Super User TV, actually. So it's an interview within an interview. Thanks so much for joining us, Alex. Pleasure. All right. So, uh, Alex, tell us a little bit about uh, why you feel that it's important to put on this event. Well. It's interesting, but um, as um, our own Gregarians likes to say, you know, to, to have, for, you know, in order to be able to execute, you have to build up some muscle memory, right? And uh, this event, being a yearly event, is important because it brings, you know, not the same but similar groups of people in a predictable cadence to discuss the evolution of the industry and through those touch points over time you can clearly understand where the industry is going and the changes that are happening from one end to another you know from year to year are the kind of the touch and control points of where the industry is evolving or pivoting you you talked about that this morning in your in your brief uh, keynote introduction this morning you were talking about the differences from when this conference first started until now can you talk a little bit about sure. that sure so um, this is our third annual right um, and the first year the bulk of the conversations was proof point that OpenStack will actually go mainstream. So people were coming in and saying, I got OpenStack like this, and then I got OpenStack like that. And people said, okay. So the, the last year, which was the second year, that was passe, because everybody understood that OpenStack is going mainstream. So then it was about workloads and VM workloads and these workloads and also about container workloads. What does it take for containers to run on top of OpenStack because container revolution was kind of taking off. This year it's um, again about containers but in a very different capacity. It's about containers maturing and containers becoming the foundation of the infrastructure. So it's not about workloads in containers running on top of OpenStack. It's about containers being the, the, the under, you know, the underpinning of OpenStack running on top and native containers and being one platform for VMs, containers and bare metal. That is also lifecycle managed in a unique, you know, uh, unified way through, you know, Kubernetes is the theme of this conference, but, you know, there are also Mesos people and Swarm people, but that's kind of the, the story. So that's one big change. And the other one is there is more conversation about business. You know, three years ago it was all technology. Last year it was technology and business kind of together. This one, a lot of technology, but, you know, the, 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 the prevalent uh, position is that to make cloud in general work in a large enterprise, it's not just technology. It's about people, it's about process, and it's about managing the end-to-end -end outcome, so the operating experience. So that's that's the kind of the evolution of the industry in the three-year period. Excellent. Was there anything in particular that you were excited to see today or that you're ex looking forward to in particular for tomorrow on day two? Well, um, I mean, I like I like the speakers, I like the themes. Uh, what's kind of new is the um, the you know the the level of involvement that Google is showing in this right so Google is an interesting company because they are they are by far the most innovative infrastructure uh, leader internally as far as how they run their infrastructure at amazing scale and they kind of were the the ultimate innovator but in the public enterprise facing cloud the innovator happened to be Amazon so if you compare in that motion, you know, where Google is, they're actually behind. So, and it's interesting that the Google, which is the ultimate innovative company, is now taking a community approach to, uh, you know, to catching up, which is not something that you normally see Google do, right? Google is always out innovating everybody else, but with Amazon, they're taking a very different approach. And it's interesting that OpenStack, the community, and the kind of commoditization of infrastructure, which is the theme that we've been writing now for, you know, for the last six years, is becoming very important, you know, for Google. So you can take the Google innovative approach, 
take it with a community commoditization approach and a community momentum approach, putting them together and building a common value proposition. And I think about six months ago, we started discussing that this may be the right motion and we're kind of laughing about it. And six months later, we see it happening in the mainstream. That's quite amazing, actually. So I can only imagine where we're going to be a year from now. Excellent. Well, Alex, thank you so much for uh, taking the time. And uh, we'll see you next year. Pleasure. Welcome. We are here with Marcus Reidiger from SAP. And uh, we are here to talk about containers and OpenStack and uh, basically to uh, join him for the customer and user experience here at uh, OpenStack Days Silicon Valley. So, uh, Marcus, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so, tell us a, a little bit about, uh, in, in sort of you know two sentences or less, um, what SAP is doing with OpenStack. Okay, um, we are we had acquisitions uh, over the last years, and um, since '97, two we're in business. So uh, we have a big transition towards our business, towards the cloud. So effectively we ended up with 23 full stack uh, proprietary built cloud uh, applications and we're on the process to build a unified um, uh, converged cloud platform where the, di the divergent use cases we have from traditional on-premise applications to cloud native applications feel a home uh, to be deployed. And uh, we have selected OpenStack obviously to power uh, the core of this. And, and why did you choose OpenStack? And we had like those 23 platforms, they all had a decent level of automation and uh, effectively we were locking up all the skilled developers in, in their silos. So effectively what we, what we have decided to do is just like, okay, let's go and write that code, um, but we don't have to write everything because it has been done already. So for us it's like a shared, a shared co code pool, um, OpenStack, where step by step you're going to see a lot more contributions from SAP. It's no net to invest because those people have been working on those platforms already. But it takes some time you know, to get the organizational change and everything in place to make that an open source uh, effort instead of like a proprietary effort. Because we have no intention to sell, so it's, it's, for us it's like a win-win situation. So now you're moving towards containers, so how are you kind of merging those two worlds? Well, we're not moving necessarily towards containers. Obviously, one demand for our OpenStack platform is to support uh, container-based infrastructure for our cloud-native payloads. But with um, containers, specifically Kubernetes, we're trying to solve the problem of operating our OpenStack at scale without having that network invest. Because there, we don't have skilled uh, open, uh, OpenStack operators. And in our 13 regions we're targeting to deploy, we can't just ramp up hundreds of people. So we're running OpenStack in Kubernetes as an application uh, in order to minimize the operations effort involved to bring, them, to bring it up um, and to actually keep it alive. And how's it gone? Uh, we're alive since July and uh, it was a big risk half a year ago when we started this. We shifted from Chef uh, to using this. No one knew if it's going to work, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's working nicely, more than nicely. So uh, we can highly recommend uh, that as a pattern for the future. As far as the conference itself, um, what have you kind of been most excited to see here today or here today? Um, I think compared to the other OpenStack days I've been participating, uh, this is less of a, let's say, enterprise uh, sales meeting. And uh, there's quite some high-profile people here, which is always uh, enlightening you know, to hear them talk about future. Um, I'm quite surprised how many container Kubernetes talks there are and how few there are about OpenStack, but that only gives me proof you know, that we can't be on the, on the wrongest path uh, for the future. Um, yeah, and the most exciting uh, talks I've, I've seen now was the one from AT&T following after us, uh, because it hits full on spot of the challenges we have been facing in the decision-making process and how we engage with the OpenStack uh, community. Um, and the uh, panel discussions, the various ones uh, we had on the topics where not someone is presenting his view, but where you know a little of exchange is, is visible if you read between the lines. Excellent. Is there anything in particular you're looking forward to tomorrow? Uh, no. Actually, I'm just going to float uh, through, the, through the event and see where it drives me. Okay, excellent. Well, uh, we're going to wrap up this Super User TV interview. Thank you so much, Marcus. We appreciate you. you joining us. My name's Sean Nguyen. I'm a senior systems engineer working on infrastructure at EMC. And I've, uh, I've been working with OpenStack since uh, the Folsom release of OpenStack. So about Three and a half years now. So you've seen a lot of changes. In oh yeah, OpenStack has grown tremendously in the last three years.
And uh, you were you were here at the last couple of conferences as well. Oh yeah, I'm a regular attendee here at OpenStack Days in Silicon Valley, and I try to make it to as many of the OpenStack summits as I can. They're just so much fun. So, what kind of progression have you seen? Well, I've seen it. I've seen it go from a point where there was a question about OpenStack and whether or not it was even really a viable solution or a viable software stack. You know, people questioned whether they should even use it at all. Uh, and now it's no really no longer a question of whether it's viable, whether it's usable, or whether it's e even going to proliferate. Because there's no doubt that OpenStack has has grown, and now it's really more about focusing on some of the specific use cases where OpenStack provides a ton of value, but has a little bit of catch-up work to it. So, what, what kind of situations are those? I, I really see that you know the, the spaces that need the most help right now are the carrier and telecommunication spaces, people that are looking to do software-defined networking, network functions virtualization, trying to take a lot of these legacy mobile and carrier systems and move them into modern architectures and modern systems. Uh, I think they're probably challenged the most. Excellent. And what are you speaking on here today? So, so today I'm going to be talking about all the various pitfalls that I've seen working with customers who have attempted to do it themselves and have insisted that OpenStack is just a series of software components that you string together. It's fairly simple and straightforward. And so they, they've gone out on their own to try and do that. And for one reason or another, they've run into some kind of difficulty. So I'm going to be talking about ways that uh, you can overcome that by working with a vendor solution using their reference architectures, using their solutions, turnkey solutions, so to ease your operation and ease your deployments. So what do you think you're most excited about, about this event? For me, it's an opportunity to see uh, a lot of people who I don't get a chance to interact with face-to-face. Uh, -face. A lot of great people who are just a part of this community and have helped contribute to OpenStack success over the years. And it's really interesting to come back and see them from time to time and hear the different messages that have honestly evolved as OpenStack has evolved and to see what they're talking about today. So thank you very much, Sean. Welcome. Uh, for Super User. Welcome. Uh, we are here for Super User TV with Luke Caney's founder and CEO of Puppet. Uh, and uh, we are here at day two of the uh, OpenStack Days Silicon Valley Conference here at the, com the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. So welcome, Luke. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so Luke, you, uh, you of course, are the, uh, the founder and CEO of Puppet, uh, which, uh, for those who are not aware, is... Now, how would you describe it? I always call it a you know, configuration management tool, but how do you describe it? It's a tool that allows you to automate your infrastructure so you can spend less time doing menial work, rework, and responding to problems and more time shipping great software to your customers. So with all of this focus on uh, sort of uh, streamlining OpenStack and, and so on and, and managing containers and orchestration and, and all of that, Puppet is a big part of that. Absolutely. So Yeah, so we, we've seen about half of all OpenStack clouds are deployed and managed by Puppet. And, and so, what is your what is your feeling on sort of the relationship between containers and OpenStack and orchestration and how all that comes together? We at, at Puppet, it, one of our core tenets is heterogeneity. One of the one of the things we do best at solving for our customers help, is helping them to manage pretty much anything. So in general, we don't have strong feelings about which technology a customer should use. We think customers should always be enabled to use the best thing they can find. And so that's what we help them do. If you want to switch to this or that or the other thing, one of, one of the jobs you should be able to hire us for is to help you switch as fast as possible to the latest and greatest technology. And for a lot of organizations, they're moving from the infrastructure they had five years ago to an open stack to a public cloud infrastructure. And a lot of them are having really deep conversations about, okay, how does containerization fit into my strategy? And right now, they're having the how does it fit in conversation in most cases. We're a production first company, so we really focus on not what you're interested in, but what you actually use to provide value to your customers. And today, containerization actually sh absolutely shows up in production in plenty of companies, but in most companies, it's still a discussion. And you know, we haven't seen yet, for them, how the two techs are gonna fit together, but we are definitely seeing some overlap in how people are thinking about deploying 
OpenStack and you know we were talking with Mirantis today about OpenStack and Kubernetes and how those two do and do not fit together and how you can align your strategy so that you don't have two completely unrelated stories but you find a way to do it both at the same time. And certainly that's our goal is to say, yes, we can manage each, each of these pieces and if you do them together or you do them, you know, there's a plant here and a plant there and, and maybe you've got some AWS and maybe you've still got some physical infrastructure because actually speed matters sometimes, you know, it shouldn't matter, you should manage it all. So uh, you are probably um, on the forefront of this whole DevOps movement. So how do you think that that came about, that this just exploded like that? It's really all because every company is becoming a software company. It, it, technology used to be what you did, right? You were, I am a software company. But now, everyone does software. So technology is how you do whatever it is you do. If you're a retail company, software is how you excel at retail. If you are a finance company, software is how you excel at finance. If you are a technology company, software in general is how you become great at whatever technology it is. And so, what that's brought with it is the industry itself is beginning to recognize that we have to learn how to optimize the process of creating software just as there was a century long revolution of getting great in manufacturing, right? You look at the early innovation of the moving assembly line from Henry Ford, from that to lean manufacturing where you've got quality all the way to the left, you've got really, really dynamic teams making on the ground decisions about how to build things. That evolution took almost a century. I think of the software revolution starting as about the time you could deliver software over the internet, so mid-90s. So by that logic, we're two decades into what I think is probably still a century-long process of becoming great at building software. And in the last 10 years, you've really seen many organizations are beginning to realize being great at software is strategic to our business and is critical to our success as a business. And as a result, they're all looking at what are the constraints, where do I need to invest, where do I need to push, what's left between here and there for us to win, and DevOps is the answer to that. And in 15 years and 20 years, we won't be talking about DevOps anymore. We'll have found that the next new constraint, but finding a way to tie the goal of operations to the value of the customer experiences is a critical part of success today, and, and that's really the, the work of DevOps. Excellent. So uh, here at the conference, what do you think is the most exciting or interesting thing that you've heard? Well, unfortunately, I actually only came in this morning, so and I've I, I've not been able to really see too many of the talks today, but I think OpenStack is in a really interesting phase because not you know a couple of years ago it was still young, not sure you know it was going to be amazing, and then it, it you know production takes a couple of years to to really uh, for people to figure out how do we take this great idea and turn it into production. Well, now clearly OpenStack is. It's widely used, it's broadly adopted, it's relied on in production by a lot of organizations. And just as OpenStack is beginning to figure it's, itself out, the containerization world shows up and says, yeah, funny story, the whole entire world has changed and you need to think about it differently. And so you've got these two waves that are almost in conflict that are trying to figure itself out. And, and those conflicts are happening on the ground at events like this of just like, oh no, what does the world look like now? What does the future look like? And, and that, that conversation I think is one that I'm most interested in. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us here at Superuser TV. Uh, we appreciate it, and uh, we'll see you next time. All right, thanks for having me. Rich Wagner, welcome to Superuser TV. Thank Th you. Thank Great you so much here. for uh, for joining us. So, uh, Mitch, you were a speaker this morning on uh, media and uh, and OpenStack. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and open source. Sorry, yes. thank you for the correction. <laughs> so, you were a speaker for media and open source. Uh, what do you think was the most important takeaway from that panel? Um, we are really, at least at light reading, we're very much focused for the enterprise cloud on the intersection of technologists and business managers. In other words, business aware technology managers, or technology aware business managers, managers people who um, want to figure out how to put the, the, the technology to work to serve the business. Um, very often when I talk to people in the open source community, they are very much concerned with the technology, just getting the technology working and, and the technology itself, and also with issues that are of interest more to the community itself and not to the larger business technology community. Um, things like getting, um, getting an open source project, you know, donating that to a particular community or, or, or some changes at a foundation. 
um, very important to the community itself, not so much to the people outside that community. So what kinds of things are important to the people outside the community that uh, community people should realize? Um, they're looking to do what businesses do. They're looking to serve their customers, uh, improve their profitability, improve their revenue, and cut costs, um, improving customer satisfaction, um, develop uh, mobile applications to serve customers in, in the way that people demand here in the 21st century. Um, Internet of Things is, is becoming, people are getting a sense that that's becoming important and has become already important in, in many sectors, including industry being probably the most interesting. Um, and that, by the way, also goes together with the cloud. So how do you deliver the cloud? How do you deliver Internet of Things applications? Well, you do it over the cloud. There's really no other way to do it. So we, we tend, in this community, we tend to very much think cloud. You know, everybody knows what the cloud is and, you know, everybody knows why they need to use it and all that. How, how prevalent is that view, or are, is there some percentage of businesses out there that are just still going, oh, no, I think I just want to keep everything here? I do see businesses that still want to keep everything on premises, and I don't think they're foolish for it either. Um, I had a fascinating conversation last year, kind of a hallway conversation at a conference like this one with a guy who worked for a, uh, uh, a chain of family restaurants. You know, like it wasn't Chili's, but it was like Chili's. And I was, he was very reluctant to move his, his, his back, back office and point of sale systems to the cloud. And I said to him, well, why? You seem like a perfect candidate for it. Your, 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 your value is your service and your food itself. You know, the, the management of the systems that deliver the ingredients to the store and your payroll systems that, and your point of sale systems. I'm sure that's the same as every, all your competitors. And he said, yeah, but nobody cares about this stuff like we do. Um, you know, if, if a cloud provider goes down, the cloud provider will say, well, gosh, we're just going to have to write you the penalty check. And meanwhile, he's, you know, out of a job, out of business. So they're keeping that there. I do think that overall, you know, hybrid cloud is the future, um, at least for the foreseeable future, which, as you know, is only a few years in this industry. Um, hybrid cloud is the future, private cloud. Uh, people want to, even if they're running their applications on premises, they still want the agility that cloud gives them. Uh, to spin up new applications fast, to spin down new applications fast, to try new things. So, what percentage of businesses you think have a, let me rephrase that, what percentage of large businesses do you think have an understanding of, of the fact that that's what they should be doing? Um, I'm going to give you, you've heard a trick question, I'm going to give you a trick answer, which is um, nearly 100%. And the reason that's a trick answer is because large enterprises are doing everything. Um, <laughs> but um, I really don't ha honestly don't have a clear sense of, of to what extent businesses are seeing that cloud, even if it's just private cloud, is the future. Um, to some extent, the companies that we talk to are self-selecting in that regard. I, I do think there is, there, there is, natural, there is a natural caution um, on the part of businesses to migrate to any new, new technology, uh, which technologists, engineers often find frustrating. But the businesses are doing it for a sound reason. If you've got um, literally 30 years invested in your line of business system, you're not going to want to move that to new technology lightly. Right. So, uh, to, to finish this off uh, okay. quickly here, um, what so here at the event? What was the most exciting thing that you think you heard here in the day and a half that you've been here? Um, I'm not going to tell you the most exciting thing yet because I just started writing it up. It was something your boss told me. Oh, <laughs> did he tell you in private or did he say it on stage? Uh, he said it uh, in a hallway conversation. Mm -hmm. So right. very very mysterious. Um, I thought the most interesting thing from our perspective at Light Reading, since um, we're historically a um, uh, uh, service provider publication. It's still primarily a service provider publication, even though we're moving into the enterprise. So from that perspective, I thought the AT&T presentation yesterday was interesting. Uh, they were talking about what they need from OpenStack. You know, not surprisingly, it was just... I, I, I have the points in my notes, I don't remember them offhand, but it was basically what everybody always wants. So like, more robust. Just make it make it harder. Make it, make it more battle-ready. Um, and he said that coming from within. You know, coming from as a full participant. Not saying you guys need to, but we all need to. 
The other thing that I thought was very interesting um, was that AT&T has an internal definition of open source. Um, we think, we all think we know what open source is, and why do you need a definition of that? Uh, you have it. Um, but he said, he, I, I gathered, I don't remember if he said it or if I'm just picking it up, reading between the lines, but I guess they got burned a couple of times. Um, a couple of the um, points I remember was the licensing has to be free. You know, you, you got to pay to run it. You got to pay to keep it going. Everybody knows, most people who know about open source know that. Um, and, but the other thing is they have to have access to the source code, all the source code. He seemed, he seemed a little skeptical, I think, of the, the hybrid um, open proprietary model, if I recall correctly, which I know is, is, is kind of mainstream in the vendor community. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. So those were kind of the two interesting things. Oh, and also um, Martin Casado, just talking about the business of open source um, and how startups can make money, um, and how they're challenging incumbents, basically because now the engineers uh, or the developers can buy what they want and don't go through the normal sales channels. They just say, here's my credit card, let me have it. Um, and um, well, lots of interesting stuff going on there. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for, for Super, from Super User TV, and uh, we'll see you thank next you. time. Thank you. Adrian, welcome to Super User TV. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what you are going to be talking about today. So I'm on a panel session with Boris and we're going to be talking about what happens when you take a product that's really designed for enterprise that updates every six months and you start to mix it in with expectations that things are updating continuously. So all the continuous delivery stuff and then there's also we're seeing a technology mix as well. So you know, from moving from everything written in Python to having Kubernetes stuck in the middle of it, which is actually written in Go. So now you've got components mixed together and you've got parts of the system that are designed to handle continuous updates and all of the implications of that. But with a microservices-based architecture, it shouldn't really matter what things are written in, should it? Well, yeah. But the protocol between the services is, you know, I'm not sure, originally it was very Python specific and I think that eventually you need to get something a bit more independent. But it's really what Kubernetes is doing is scheduling the containers that make up the various component features of, of OpenStack. And that's, that's sort of putting it in the guts of the system and then using it also. The, the other thing that I think is particularly interesting is as you move from the big struggle being just getting OpenStack, you know, to have all the features it needs to be useful and, and out there working at scale. Then you get the uh, the developers come along and say, "Well, it's just got this API. You know, what do I, how do I do something interesting with that?" So what you really want is something on top to run containers. So having, I think Kubernetes has a, a role as the container scheduler for applications running on this, as well as the thing that you use for continuously managing and updating your the guts of your system. So it's the two different places where it, it ties in. I mean, when you now have Kubernetes uh, managing your containers, I mean, how is that really an improvement though over, okay, well, I have an API to you know, manage OpenStack. Okay, so now I have an API to manage containers. I mean, we're not really giving the developers anything more than before, are we? Well, you're moving on from basically having machine images which take a while to build and a while to deploy to containers that are take seconds to build and seconds to deploy. So there's a reason why everyone else has basically moved to using Docker or whatever to deploy things. Um, so given that developers are spitting out a whole pile of Docker containers, you have to figure out a way to run them. So let's just make that standardized and let's get it out there so that you have a way to do it. Okay. And are you seeing um, legacy, not even so much legacy, but existing non uh, cloud native workloads still staying in virtual machines? So to, I think some extent, but if you think about a legacy workload built into a virtual machine, it's probably built into a VMware virtual machine. And then if you want to run it on KVM or, you know, or Zen, you, you have to do something, you have to rebuild it again. But I think what people are doing often is taking that VM application and turning it into a big fat container full of whatever junk had to be there to make it work then continuing to run that in wherever they needed it to run it. So if you pop up one level from the VM, you get out of having to decide which virtualization framework you want. 
then you've got portability between you know VMware and OpenStack and whatever else you want and public clouds and you just have one way to run that thing. So that's I'm seeing a few people working in that direction, using containers as a way to just abstract away from the contain from the VM format. So that's one of the advantages of containers. What are the what are the advantages of using OpenStack? Well if you're trying to run stuff in your data center, you can handcraft it or you can build some automation on it. And really you have to build automation on it. So if you're building relatively complex infrastructure, you need drivers for all of the different pieces to build that out of. I just see OpenStack as the the generic way to, I mean it's like device drivers for the, all the cards you could plug into your Linux box, right? You have to have a device driver for every card, every PCI card. I think there needs to be an OpenStack driver for everything you might want to have in your data center. And then you can have the interfaces to talk to them so that every network switch has a common kind of interface. You know, every storage system has a common kind of interface. So that's, I think, the, the ultimate value here, that we finally got every vendor to agree that there was at least one set of APIs to do that with, rather than having you know, 10 different APIs. Wonderful. So uh, what are you most excited about coming to this conference about? Um, let's see. I think it's interesting to see things just this sort of collision between the, the sort of developer-driven infrastructure world that's um, been building up over the last few years and the sort of you know, operations enterprise-oriented world and sort of how these two things are now mixing and sort of trying to figure out the, what actually happens when you try to change everything 10 times a day and you're trying to change, change something every six months as well. Right, you get a new release once every six months. That's, and then the other thing that's shaking all this stuff up is security related issues. Every time you get a vulnerability, and we've got you know, a huge number of vulnerability scanners now, pretty much every vendor has some kind of vulnerability scanner. So you can look at your system and say, okay, this has a known problem in it because you're running some version of something, right? And you have to be able to get in there and automatically replace that. So that requires automation to do it right. You know, hand fixing every machine that had a heart bleed bug in it was like, those people still haven't finished doing that. The people that, you know, that was what, a year or two ago? There were still machines out there running that bug, right? And the people who were on heavy automation just turned it over in hours or days or whatever to, to do the, did I, am I going to break anything by rolling out this new thing? Right, so we've got to get to this point where when there's a vulnerability, you can respond to it immediately, and that just requires automation. And you've got to have an API to get to something. It's fundamentally what it comes down to. Well, thank you so much from, uh, for joining us here on Super User TV. Thank you.